Welcome to my talk called Simple Modern Java Microservices in the Cloud. If your reaction is bingo, your reaction is correct. And today is the 83, 833 day of the pandemic, or day 118 of the other event, which is the Russian invasion in Ukraine. I really hope it finishes very quickly. And TLDR, if you're sleepy, if you didn't have enough nerves, like I just had, uh, if you have a lot of services and a lot of business complexity to deal with, try to limit the number of moving things. This will pay back later. In, multipli in multiplies because it's going to make your life simpler and easier and nicer and so on and so on. My name is Andrzej Grzesik and I'm in a very privileged position because I'm in a country in which most people can spell and say my name properly. If you don't, ask a local and they will tell you how to do it. Anyway, I usually go by Axe because for those of you who cannot, it's just much easier. And I have an email. If you want the slides, email me. If you want to tweet at me, tweet at me. Uh, if you would like to know anything else, I also run a conference. I'm a Java champion, I'm a Java one rockstar. And I'm going to be speaking very quickly. If I speak too quickly in any moment of the talk, there is the signal. Raise your hands. And if I notice multiple hands being raised, I will treat it as, no, it's not a question. It's a slow down man. And I'll try to. If you have any questions about the talk during the talk, you can wave. If I notice you, I will try to react or maybe repeat your question and answer it. If I don't, because the lights are very bright, then apologies, because I didn't see it. If you have any questions about Revolut, we have a booth downstairs. I happen to work there. Uh, let's chat about that later. Uh, obviously, Revolut is hiring. And obviously, any opinions presented here are my own. I do not say anything uh, in line or out of line of my company. And uh, apologies for any stupid mistakes that I make here. And I like dry jokes. So the first question is, uh, what makes a Java service modern? When is something that we work with modern? Uh, is it the language? Is it going to be written in Go and it, that makes it modern? Well, Go has been around for some time. If it's going to be in Ceylon, is it going to be modern? Is it, I don't know, what is the current most fancy or most modern language? I don't know, and I don't think that it is the language. Is it the technology that we're using? Is it the fact that we are running in the cloud that it makes the software modern? Is it the framework that we're using? Is it the version of the framework that we're using? Is it the latest release of the framework? Well, let's, let's think about it. Or maybe it's, it's the architecture. And we'll try to go through those questions, and we'll try to cover those in some detail. But before we do that, I would like you to give some space to your imagination. Imagine writing software in the purest, most pleasant form. Software without any bloat. Software that has no restrictions so that you can just code away in any direction that you want. Can you feel it? Can you picture it? Is it nice? Does it feel nice? Should it be nice? And now, think about the software that some of you maybe have or maybe have had to deal with at work. Uh, is there a difference? Probably there is. Is the difference because of code quality? Do you believe this code quality matters? Is good co code quality the one that you usually have in a green field early on because there are no restrictions? Something that you would like to uh, safeguard to keep for the length and duration of the whole project. How would you code? How would work uh, life balance be? How would your work satisfaction be if you could always or almost always code the best code possible and be very proud of it? Uh, obviously, if you try to approach this uh, subject from the point of view of libraries, technologies, frameworks, opinions will differ because contexts differ. But there is one common element that will, not, that will always be mentioned by everybody, and that is bloat. Bloat, like in here, and luckily I'm not going to sing, but if we are going to focus on languages first, if we just use, well, whatever your language is, uh, some people will say Scala. I would actually agree with a lot of them. Some people will say use Clojure. Some people will say use something else. It usually does not make a difference. As in, you can have bad code and you can have good code in almost any language. And uh, there is another way to language or technology checks that I actually uh, apply. And the check goes like this. Imagine it's 2 AM. You're just coming back from maybe house of beer, maybe house of something else. Uh, you've had a gentle evening out. So fun was being had. You're just 
tired. And now you need to, for some strange reason, uh, approach the production environment and, and fix something in the software because it is not working and it's preventing somebody from doing something. And then how readable, how easy to comprehend is the software that you have to reason about? And this is what then drives my decisions about is the language or how I use the language applicable and do I like it? Is it maintainable? Is it going to be very easy and straightforward to reason about or not? So for me, that ends up with personal choices being Java and or Scala. Java almost always because you can call it verbose. You can call it slightly less evolved compared to some of the more developed languages. But on the other hand, it is productive, it's reliable, it's trustworthy, it is very explicit, which means if something doesn't work, you can read it because it's, it's there. And what about frameworks? Which framework should we today, on the second, 22nd of June, use so that our software can be modern? Well, I haven't checked the weather or the framework weather of the day, but probably the opinions will differ. So the answer is it's not the framework, obviously. Is this answer in the database? Which one should you use? Should you use, use SQL? Should you use NoSQL? Should you go back to SQL? Uh, 10 years ago, or more, everybody was, scream or everybody was screaming NoSQL. Then everybody sc started screaming NoSQL, but that meant not only SQL. Now it's back to SQL. Many companies actually use this guy. We use it as well. We like Postgres. It solves 99% of our storage problems. It also creates most of the storage problems that we have, but uh, it's a very good database. There are other good storage solutions. There is Cassandra, which I've used in the past, and I liked it for what I needed it. It did what I expected, and it works. So bottom line, you've already got it. It's not the single technology that you're going to choose for storage or anything that makes your software modern. So, is it the architecture? Should you use Lambda? Should you use CQRS? Should you use event sourcing? Well, if they apply to your problem domain, absolutely you should, but they are not going to make or break your software. They are not going to define whether you, the, the software that you're dealing with is being modern. Maybe there is a new application called maybe Theta Epsilon, Epsilon Psi, Pi or something else that we still have to invent that is only going to be the finite ultimate modern architecture, but Probably not. So is having tests making our application modern? Well, everybody always says that they wished they wrote more tests. And so this is common, this is uh, normal. And uh, in the place I work, we actually write a lot of tests. As in, it's normal that we have hundreds of thousands of unit test cases and tens of thousands of functional tests across multiple applications. And we use them every time we deploy, and we do it very often. Tests are essential to being modern. They are not the only element. But then, of course, you can meet a very energetic, very driven, very passionate engineer from somewhere who will say, no, the answer to modern is this. You have to use Kotlin, Kafka, and Kubernetes. Uh, that's an opinion. I don't disagree with that, or I don't agree. I'm only going to say that for any number of those very eager engineers, you're going to meet a similar number who, will, who are going to call this thing a 3K ap apocalypse. Uh, those technologies have nothing bad about them in particular. If they solve your problem domain, use them. If they don't, don't. But this is the bottom line that I'm trying to get to. If uh, you have business complexity, and at the same time as you're dealing with an uncertain business domain and you're trying to solve this business complexity, if you try to add a layer of technology uncertainty because you want to learn and do something more enjoyable, uh, then you have two problems that you're trying to solve. And mostly people, or as engineers, people who still write code, uh, like to uh, focus on the technology bits as well because it gives us endorphins, it gives us pleasure, it's normal. But I'm going to twist the question uh, of what makes a service modern into, is there anything wrong with legacy? And I will say that probably there is not. There is a different thing that we actually intuitively want to get away from. And this thing is something I call calcification. I don't know if there is software cal calcification in, in anywhere, but it's a term that exists in biology. 
And this definition, bravely copy-pasted from Wikipedia, says that calcification is a process in which calcium salts accumulate in body tissue. And that means that the soft tissue cannot move as freely because it's not elastic anymore. And then it calcifies. And this is the thing that I think most of people who work with software actually are trying to avoid it. This is what we usually call legacy. No, software that is very hard to change because it's calcified is the software that we usually don't enjoy working with. So let's take a trip back in time, maybe more than 35 minutes when we had projector problems. You probably rec recognize this guy. And if we, if we drive it long enough and our car batteries don't burn, uh, we can go to, I don't know which year was that, I don't remember, when the big happened. And the, or as some other uh, people say, including uh, some ministers, some places, uh, it might have never happened. No, that's actually too, too far. Let's go back to EJBs. Who here has worked with EJBs? I see around a third of the room. That's a significant crowd. According to Wikipedia, which, as far as I know, has an oversimplified and not entirely accurate history of EJBs, it's all IBM's uh, fault. Uh, the exact history is a bit more complex and more uh, distilled. I'm not going to go there. We're not going to go archaeologic about EJBs. What we're going to look at uh, now is year 1999, when we got server serverless specification 2.2. This is a very significant thing for us Java people and for anybody who, who used to work with Java J2E or JE later because web applications were being made possible in the Java platform. And then year 2001, obviously we had this awesome movie, uh, but also year 2001 brought us EJB 2.0. The difference between EJB 1 and EJB 2.0 was speed because you could get EJBs to communicate with, 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 uh, well, with one another without using RMI, so you could do local calls, yeah, radical. And also they use something that uh, is called xdoclet. If you know what I mean, I can understand the face expressions. If you don't know what I mean, then don't look it up because it's terrible and it's really not worth your time. But shortly after, the amazing EJB 2.0 came something even more amazing, something called Spring 0.9. Associated with this book, again, according to the annals of the internet, I haven't, I don't remember it uh, from my own memory, so it might, I might be inaccurate here, but Spring 0.9 happened because EJBs were too complex and too painful to work with. If you've worked with EJBs, you probably agree because, yeah, that was the thing. And then we got AJAX. AJAX, as almost everybody now agrees, stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and JSON, because who really sends XML over AJAX now? Then we go on, we get EJB 3.0. EJB 3.0 because old EJBs were too complex. And then comes year 2014, we get Spring Boot 1.0, yay! And why do we get Spring Boot uh, 1.0? Because some people say that Spring was too big and too complex. I am not going to offer any opinions on the Spring framework whatsoever. I'm going to call it sometimes useful. And instead I'm going to quote uh, one random person who I managed to find on YouTube uh, who said that Java EE had a more thought through and smaller API in comparison to 10 times bigger Spring. Uh, is that accurate? Is that inaccurate? It doesn't really matter. We're, we, this is not about what framework is the best or which one is the smallest, biggest, more, most complex. But then we started getting a thing called microprofile, which is making Spring or Java EE smaller and simpler. So I think you now get what lies between the lines of what I'm saying. The overall trend that we seem, and, and well, not seem, we actually keep observing in the software that you're dealing with is called simplicity. And simplicity is what we want to maintain because if software is simple, then it's easy to reason about and it's easy to deal with and it's easy to change and so on and so on. Calcification becomes much different because it's going to be much more evident. So how do we approach simplicity in the stack? Let's have a look at a very simple example called Hello World. How in Java are you going to do this? Luckily, the year is 20, uh, 2022 uh, because uh, there was an old joke that uh, in Java, hello world is 3,000 lines plus 1,700 XML descriptors. Uh, right now, 
according to these frameworks, you can get a hello world that it looks more or less like this. Obviously, there are more frameworks that can give you a similar experience, but it has finally become uh, simple. You don't need a lot of bloat. You don't need to define a web uh, descriptor. You don't need a container. You don't need any, anything like that. You don't need to have servers, filters, interceptors, all of that. The frameworks provide an endpoint, because that's what we want to do, because that's what uh, probably our RESTful service will require, and then we can move on. And if we look at those three frameworks in particular, somebody is probably going to ask me after the talk finishes, which one should you choose? Uh, there is one thing I'm going to point them to, which is their GitHub activity. That is Helidon. As you can see, a lot of activity and somebody in front of the camera. And this is Spark. And this is Javelin. So uh, what we use uh, at Revolut right now, uh, Spark Java powers most of our applications. As in, easy to say, probably 90% plus. Uh, how can we do this? Uh, because it's simple, it doesn't do anything else that we don't want uh, it to do or we don't need. And if you ask me today which framework would I choose if I were to do new applications, my personal favorite uh, is Heliton right now. Just because I tried it, it worked for me, and it's not that I have run any comparisons. It's just simple and, and does, the, does the job. So how do we keep the services modern? My answer, or my theory, is instead of focusing on the technology, we would like to prevent calcification, make the software easy to work with and nimble for as long as possible. So how does complexity happen then? The answer is obviously one commit at a time. Now let's turn the question around. Have you ever met somebody with an attitude of let's build the most legacy software that we can imagine. I actually have. There was one contest at one conference in Poland uh, some number of years ago. Uh, the goal was literally to make the most legacy enterprise application immediately as, uh, as possible. But in most cases, this is not what we want to do. We want to actually solve a problem, and then the, the, the thing happens. Uh, one gateway that you can notice among your colleagues is uh, instead of doing aiming to build legacy, they will say, ah, let's do whatever, we don't care. If you don't care, well, then you're on a good path to do that. But if you do care, then you don't want to do it, most likely. So frameworks. Uh, which frameworks should you use? Uh, there was a time in the Java ecosystem in which people approached any problem of, uh, that they needed to with, let's use Spring and Hibernate. And by the way, what is this project going to be? So. Before knowing what the problem domain was, before knowing what the problem is, they already knew that they're going to use Spring and Hibernate. And there is nothing wrong with Spring or Hibernate. It's just people really enjoyed using them. And they didn't apply the litmus test whether they are actually suitable for the job. So what can you do? You can approach it with the same 2 AM uh, or 2 in the morning test. It's late. Fun has been had. Is the framework absolutely necessary? Do you need it? Or is it adding complexity that you don't want to? Uh, why? Why do I, do, I, uh, do I approach it this way? Because in my opinion, there are two kinds of engineers, obviously, along one of the dimensions. Uh, those who have and those who will have to fix things at night. If you fix things at night and you've had to reason about uh, maybe crazy convoluted code and an esoteric language, it's probably not obvious what is wrong, and then it takes time, and it takes sometimes days, sometimes hours, and it's not pleasant, it's stressful. I don't think most of you here enjoy it. I certainly don't. So I like to approach code that I run uh, so that I, in a way that I can see it. So the premise that we employ and apply in Revolut very often, or almost always, is code being run should be visible. And obviously, this code should also be tested. So we follow. Uh, a pattern which we call no magic frameworks, uh, which means we try to avoid frameworks which try to do too much for their own good because we want only a limited amount of functionality out of them. And this is not our own invention. We didn't create it. As in this trend has been around in many places. And if you look at uh, just some frameworks out there, as in things that, that 
Drop Wizard, which has been around for what, 10 years plus now, probably. Uh, Finagle, which has been around for a long time, and so on and so on, came out of the very same need. Somebody needed to expose services, which would be simple, and do not complain, sorry, do not contain magic that's unrelated and unnecessary for the problem at hand. Bottom line is apage, unnecessary complexity. What does it look like in code? This is actually one of our application startup code. Given most of you see it for the very first time in your lives, can you figure out what happens? Can you tell me how this application starts? I think most of you can, because it's right over there. Uh, on the other hand, if you contrast it with some of the more complex and contrast and colorful uh, ways of starting an application within a container in a fleet of something, then I like this one more, because I can reason about it. Because if something breaks in line, I don't have the line numbers, but if something breaks in a specific moment, I can put my debugger in there, and I know what happens. Or if the exception happens in a specific line, I exactly know what was happening there. I can reason about the state, and I know how to fix it, usually. So quality. There is a lot of good talks about quality. There is a lot of good people who are dealing with quality on a daily basis. We are writing tests. I've mentioned we have uh, hundreds of thousands of, of them, and we keep writing them with every pull request. But what I would say is know the time you are building for. Not what day of the week you want the feature to be ready for, but think about the time scale or the longevity of the application that you're building. If you're building an application that you expect to be around for the next two years, you're going to be investing your time in for the next two years, then it will benefit from having more tests. There is this diagram, shamelessly copy-pasted from Martin Fowler's blog, uh, which tries to depict the uh, quality versus delivery speed. And uh, intuitively, we understand uh, what happens there. Uh, the problem num number one, or problem number zero, because we're software people in here, is uh, we do not, we cannot measure, we cannot say exactly where is this crossing point. Uh, Martin Fowler claims that this occurs in weeks. If you're very smart people embodied in a single problem, it might actually happen in months. Uh, the premise is, if your software is going to live around for a long time, write tests, because they are going to support you. They are a tool that optimize and help deliver longevity for your software. At Revolut, we, ex we assume that any application that we build uh, should be, if nothing changes, uh, available to and, and, and possible to be run for the next couple of years. And also, this application should, uh, should work perfectly fine no matter how many new customers we get, which is sometimes obviously not what, what happens because reality is reality after all. But Instead of making decisions about the amount of testing, right in that tiny, very biased point, we assume the application is going to get there, and we are going to optimize for that point, because most of our applications are going to be somewhere in that point. And yes, the bottom scale obviously doesn't have any units, but think about medium to long term, months to maybe multiple years. Obviously, reality surprises you, and even a quick fix that was supposed to happen, which only was supposed to take a few minutes, took a few more. The same happens with software. This, written in words, can be, for example, in interpreted as, it is inefficient to build software that immediately needs a rewrite. So if you've made a bug, if you need to redeploy, then why did you make the bug in the first place? Obviously, tests are a tool to help you prevent and not build those bugs in. Nobody does it by uh, their choice, but things happen. We also decided to go with constructor-based injection. Somebody could say it's a bit radical. Uh, in our view, it is not. Uh, the reason why we decided to go with only constructor-based injection is uh, we want to see how many dependencies are there. If you have a constructor that is this big, you can make uh, a certain assumption about it. If you, on the other hand, see a constructor that starts growing like that, it is becoming suspicious. Uh, and because it's in the constructor, you can know and you can reason about what is going to be available in where and when, which means if you have to add a new thing that has to be descended uh, upon, and 
added across a stack of constructors, it's a single refactoring in IntelliJ. It's, it's easy. But if you're starting to do a lot of this work, then you probably is, are going to get a trigger of, hey, am I really doing the right thing? And this is uh, opposed to using a magic framework that would just allow us to say at inject, or maybe not even at inject, maybe some other annotation, and just make the bean happen in some specific place. There is nothing wrong with that approach. It's just we chose to have an explicit signal and to have it very visible to us if we are injecting something into a place where it's not yet present. We also like immutability. Uh, immutability uh, is something uh, that you might use uh, case classes for, or data classes for, or value classes for, or records. So any entity, or most of entities uh, in our software are going to look something like this. You will have a lot of public, uh, public fields, which we are now slowly adjusting to having uh, accessors. And they are going to be final, which means they are going to be immutable. And then they are going to be of known types. And you can see also we have specific IDs, so that a wallet ID cannot be compared to a pocket ID or to a user ID, because if you try to compare a human to a wallet or pocket, it makes no sense. And so the type system will prevent us from doing so. Of course, under the hood, they are UUIDs. But a UUID you can compare to another one. On the other hand, specific IDs, not. But you will also see one extra thing here. And those extra things are in the bottom. And they go like this. So you can see the check required, check required, check whatever else. Uh, we do those checks, and we in include those checks almost everywhere. We want to uphold the invariance everywhere. Somebody could say, well, that, that's a lot of code that's already duplicated. You can reason about the input variable that you are going to get there. So, well, the owner ID, if you've gotten it from somewhere else, this might be redundant. Is it not? Are you, why are you asking me to verify the same thing over and over again? And I would say, yes, you're an excellent audience. It's an excellent question. And actually, this is such an excellent question that I've already prepared an answer in the slides for you. Because as the system grows, this is tiny amount of stability injected in many of the points within your system. That means that you have some magic stability dust that you just sprinkle across your application. Obviously, it's not going to fundamentally fix or make your application stable and never crashing and so on. No, that, there is no magic. There is no such thing. But this is a small amount of help that over time gives compound interest in terms of stability and being able to reason about. Not having nulls, not having things outside of bounds, not having things that just don't belong in a specific place as their domain guides it. And soon, obviously, Java 17 is going to allow us to do that, that, that but I'm going to skip it. But there will be a question, probably about why would we not use Lombok? And this is a question for the audience. Because we're slightly behind time as, and I'm going to wait 10 seconds from now, asking, can this lead to a bug? Or can you tell me what the bug is here? OK, 10 seconds has passed. Uh, to speed things up. At data should be creating an immutable value object, which means we have certain expectations. But at the same time, Lombok allows us to create a setter through an annotation. Uh, it's a choice. And what looks like an immutable data class, so for something that you could use as a key for a hash map, is actually mutable. And if you put a mutable key into a hash map, and then you keep the reference to that key, and then you mutate it, well, good luck finding. So, where do we, at Revolut, store mutability? Well, option one is obviously the data store. You know that we use Postgres. We do use it a lot. Another option is uh, using CQRS and even sourcing and cheating around having mutability by not having it. That's another good thing. But the question that we are going to uh, wonder for a second is, why do we use Postgres? Who here feels comfortable reasoning about relational databases? 
I think most of you. Who here has no clue about how relational databases work whatsoever? I see one brave hand. Uh, this is exactly the reason why we decided to go with maybe not the most exciting technology around, or actually quite exciting if you do follow Postgres, but it, it can do a lot. But it has a well understood concurrency model. So we know what happens and you know how to scale it, you know how to tune it, you know what the consistency model is, which means you know when certain data sets have been recorded and they are therefore durable. Uh, there is no such thing as eventual consistency uh, defined as crazy as in some other data stores. Obviously there is an aspect of that, there is replication lag if you run distributed and so on and so on. But also there is predictable performance model, which in the case of a startup that enjoys a very stable and intensive growth is a very important thing, as in we know how to scale Postgres, we know how to tune it. And this is probably what you would know as well, because, well, it's a relational database. You add, you add indexes, you add views, you partition your data. Those are the tools that a lot of people who go to study uh, computer science at universities or at some other educational venues, they will learn about it, or you can read about it or listen to excellent talks about it. And this is what we do. Also, we use Flyway uh, to help us with migrations, and Flyway or Liquibase are excellent tools that help people manage migrations. And we have them next to the sources of our applications always, so that everybody can see what is actually in the schema of the database. There are no DBAs in Revolut, as in engineers own the services, engineers will evolve the services. And we do test data stores with test containers, and I know Oleg wanted me to mention that he has a talk about test containers, so yeah, I do recommend his talk, it's probably going to be nice. If you're using Docker in production, if you need a license, well, maybe you need to look at around it. But we also use Juke, so no Hibernate, by, but Juke, why? Because Juke reads like SQL that it generates, which means it's going to be correct, and it is going to be very predictable. If you have a SQL a query that you know what it looks like, you can run and explain, analyze, and you can see why it happens the way it happens, you can see which indexes it uses, and so on and so on. If you need to change it, you just change it. So, some facts about software. Legacy will happen more, well, sooner or later, even though we try to avoid it as much as we can. And we all know that software is read much more often than it is written. That's a fact well known, especially by, by those who know it. But when you're working with microservices, there are also other things that start to matter. Domains, areas of responsibility, architecture. Who takes care of those? In our uh, view of the world, or in our way of doing software, we uh, define something as, well, we define maintainers to be the people who are the primary guardians of any specific application. So any application that we have in Revolut will have a set of people, defined maintainers, who follow you build it, you run it model, which means you break it, you fix it. Uh, if you need to modify the infrastructure for the application, just go ahead. If you need to have more containers, go ahead. If you need a bigger database, go ahead, modify the infrastructure, infrastructure as code and apply the changes, let them uh, deploy themselves, and then that will be done. And so on and so on. If you need monitoring us, and I'm going to skip this part, but we, have, we don't have on-call support. We, on the other hand, we have engineers who are looking after applications and are going to analyze and triage on, uh, irregular pattern, patterns of behavior, and they are going to create bugs and assign them to specific teams. Why engineers? Why not, I don't know, random support people? Uh, primarily because en engineers are the ones that use those signals and use those bugs and tickets created in JIRA uh, later for, uh, to deal with and, and, and fix those issues. And also, they are the ones that are going to be then on the receiving end. So if you, as, the, an, as an engineer, are going to be on the receiving end of a specific bug report, if you find it amazing, you're going to try to, sim to do a similar job when you have to write one. And vice versa. If you've received a not descriptive enough or maybe cloudy, murky, uh, bug report, you are going to try to write your own bug report better so that it doesn't fall on those areas. And then we have to talk about, our, talk about architecture. Before you say anything, this is not our architecture, this is shamelessly stolen from Twitter. What I mean when I say architecture is 
primarily a shared understanding. What we want to build is for, so that people who deal with a specific piece of software, they know what they are dealing with and they can understand what happens when they do something. Well, they, when they press here, is it going to pop up in here or maybe it's going to dip in, the, in there? So some people will say that something like this becomes architecture. I will say, no, nah, it is more like an inventory list which basically tells you what services you have. Some people will say, no, if we put things into domains, this is going to become our architecture. No, this will become a service map, which means if you have a feature to build, you will know in which area you need to build it because it doesn't give you understanding. And in order to have understanding and in order to prove that you have understanding, you should understand and be able to reason about the consequences that affect you. How can you verify that you have that? This is a question about documentation. How do we then document what we built and how we, why we built it in a certain way? Well, there is an excellent talk by Simon happening in parallel to this one. I'm not going to ask you to, to, to leave, absolutely, you know, stay with me. Uh, but the two tools that we use is, uh, are called design reviews or RFCs, whatever you want to call it, and architecture decision logs. Architecture decision uh, records uh, a document which describes what was the context of a change, what is the change, and what were the assumptions, and under, so what, under what circumstances were certain decisions made. So uh, when somebody needs to make a change to a system, they are go people are going to write a document, and it's going to be reviewed by the people who review it. We'll come back to that in a second. And they're going to explain what changes, why and where, and what alternatives were considered, and yeah, who makes those changes? Do we have architects? No. Every single engineer or every engineer in the team that needs to write one can write it. Obviously, some people will pref prefer to be uh, more vivid in, and, and lively in there and active in those areas. Some people will not. And who prepares the documents? Who will review them? Also engineers. We don't have architects. We have seniors and we leads, and they are the ones that are going to, hey, your service, what do you want to do there? Well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Why? Because the consequences of those changes are going to be something that engineers will have to deal with. So they will have to fix the bugs. They will have to deal or adjust performance or scalability or anything uh, involved or related to that change. Maybe they will have to change their own applications and refactor some things because of that. Then you could ask me a question of how do we diagram? How should you diagram? Should you want to adopt the practice? My recommendation is going to say, to mention two things. One, use the C4 model. It's an awesome default. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. It, it works. It's awesome. Pick whatever works for you out of it and, and, and just use it. And also use a text-based uh, architecture diagramming tool. As an, I do recommend Plant UML because it's open source and free, uh, which also means you do not need a license for enterprise architect or anything like that to do architecture. You can actually do it with text. And we, software people, working with text on a daily basis, can easily put that into GitHub, which means you end up with uh, this version and uh, maybe CIable. And also, because we want engineers to be able to refer and think about consequences of what other services are doing, they, we also give every engineer in Revolut access to all of the source code of all of the other services. So me, he's standing here. If I notice anybody working on any different service, I can go into our bit, bit bucket and read what they have there. I can make, make pull requests. It doesn't mean that they will get merged, but I can make them. Who makes the decision whether a pull request should get merged and will get merged? Well, it's the service owners, so the engineers who are associated with a service as maintainers. Why? Because they have the skin in the game, they understand the consequences, and they are the ones that will have to maintain it if something breaks or works strangely and so on. And so on. And I'm going to skip this part slightly, but what about interactions? Should you use RPC? Should you use gRPC? Should you use, I don't know, something else? Maybe telepathy. Yeah, telepathy is awesome, absolutely do it. But apart from that, most of the services that we have follow a few interaction patterns. We have an RPC way, we have events, and we have batches. As non-exciting as it sounds, this is exactly what we do. But on top of that, instead of asking people to adapt and adjust to a specific maybe REST interface or maybe something else, service owners will create clients. And a client in 
Revolut service kind of way, is if I have a service called Banana, if you want to use Banana, you're going to use a jar, most likely, called Banana Client, and that's going to do the communication between Banana and Banana Client so that your application can do whatever it wants from the business point of view, but the underlying details of how it's done technically is hidden. Who creates those clients? Well, the service owners. And who maintains them? The service owners. If you need an interaction that is no, not yet present in, in Banana Client, of course you can make a PR and work with the service owners to get it merged and deployed and so on and so on. And that, that very frequently happens. But that means we do not have to worry about the same piece of work being repeated over and over and again. And if you just need to talk to somebody, well, just use it and it works reasonably well. I'm going to skip this part, but I wanted to cover that. I said modern Java microservices in the cloud. But what about monitoring? What about Kubernetes? What about cloud native? What about continuous delivery? Uh, there is this awesome paper from uh, the magazine called uh, IT Doesn't Matter, and the paper is called IT Doesn't Matter, by Nicholas Carr. Uh, what this paper says is whether you're using Kubernetes or Lambda or serverless or anything else, it will most likely not make a big difference to the business that you're in. If you're a platform company, if you work for Amazon, obviously this is, this is your bread and butter, this is what you deal with. But for people who work with services and software that is supposed to solve business problems, it's implementation details, sadly. As exciting and as excited as I am about those. So the answer to this is solve it once, pick something that works for you, and, and, and just move on, because the complexity and the devil is elsewhere. Because software is supposed to solve business problem. Having said that, there is one follow-up question that hangs in the air. How do we capture business reality then? Because defining and describing this business reality is difficult. This is the technique to use. If you know about event storming and you use it, great for you. If you don't know about it, I would recommend uh, reading uh, about event storming and trying to do it because it's, I find it a very useful practice. It allows to describe and explain what are the business changes that a specific piece of software is trying to adjust and uh, apply. And this is because I think that software is a people problem primarily. And protein-based, humans, human-based, doesn't scale that often. So TLDR, because we're going to, to the finish so we can let the next awesome speaker onto the stage. Uh, there is plenty of complexity in the software that you, we are dealing with. We and I encourage you to do the same, optimize for long term, and think about the long term. What is the software going to be like in the next two years? Try to build quality and try to build resilience every time, uh, in a, at every aspect. And software that is simple to understand and scale and change is going to be much more pleasant and feel more modern and fresh for a longer period of time. Uh, before I finish, I'm going to throw some book covers that are nice reads, and hopefully you, they will inspire you to do even more amazing things uh, after reading them. And with that, I will say thank you very much. Enjoy the conference. If you want the slides, drop me an email. And I am, I am afraid we, are, we don't have a lot of time to question, for questions, so just grab me at Revolut booth and let's talk there. Have a great day. Enjoy DevOps. Bye-bye.